John Darvel on BBC Radio Bristol. Now, I don't know about you, but are you wondering where your robot butler is or your robot driver or your robot maid? Robots haven't quite got where we thought they would get, but there's a lot of work being done on robots and what makes robots work, move and function. Maybe the insect world actually has some of the answers. Dr Edmund Hunt is a scientist from the University of Bristol who studies insects and animals and applies their teachings and the knowledge he gains from them to robotics and he's here with me in the studio this morning good morning to you good morning now yes. let's sort of talk about your your original work because you were originally involved looking at animals and financial markets and regulation weren't you that's right yeah um so uh i started off my my career studying physics yeah um Ended up then working uh, in in economics, finance, that sort of thing, in in banking regulation, in fact. Physics Um, to banking regulation. (laughs) That's interesting. I I suppose there's numbers involved in it. Uh, It's about, you know, Port Talbot Railway on wheels. No, can't see the link, really. How on earth did that happen? Well, there's a lot of complex mathematics involved in in the world of finance, as you Mm. you might expect. So kind of understanding how that works is is necessary in order to regulate it properly. So I I was doing that around sort of 2009 through to... Oh, so, hang on a minute. So, so, oh, right. Where so are you? Sort of fixing you? the financial crisis was what I was trying it's, to do it's at first. A lot of complex mathematics that you need to understand, which will help you. Uh, I think it would be fair to say that there was a lot of complex mathematics that very few people understood that was Indeed, going on yes. in, the, in the financial world. <laughs> Hence the reason where people were looking at things going, hang on a minute. This isn't worth the paper it's written on. Yes. And then we get the financial price, cr- uh, crash. Looking at that at that time, I suppose it, the, the first manifestation of that here in the UK was Northern Rock, but it was sort of ticking along quite nicely for about a year beforehand in America. Yes. That must have been a fascinating time when you're researching why these sorts of things are happening, and then it happens. Yes, no, it's very interesting, and then trying to think about well, what what are the rules that we need to to fix that, right? Um, so that's the financial system is a really good example of a complex system where there's lots of different interacting parts, and there's sort of unexpected emergent behaviour. Um, and I felt at the time that I didn't really understand it properly. Mm. You know, I felt that there was a lot more to learn, which is how I ended up uh, going back to university, coming to Bristol for a PhD uh, in this field of of complex systems, it's called. Um, and I didn't know I'd end up studying ants, <laughs> but I ended up in the biology department because they are a brilliant example of a, a kind of miniature society, right? So you think mm. of the human economy, millions of people, and ant society is maybe 100 individuals. And so you can mm. you can study it on the uh, on the bench top in the lab and really understand how they're sharing information with each other uh, to make decisions exploring their environment it's um, a fascinating thing isn't it because you, i mean basically the essence of the financial system is a promise and the trust that that promise will be delivered, which is effectively what currency is, isn't it? The currency is not actually worth it. It's a piece of paper that's got five yes. pounds on it, but it's about the confidence that that's worth five pounds and the trust that ultimately someone somewhere, if they ever had to redeem it, that would be redeemable. That's it's correct. A yes. pure, it's a pure promise based on trust. Yes, it's it's a fiat currency, which the root of that word is yeah. faith, I think. Cause yeah, as, fiat, as you yeah say. exactly. So, so when we talk about fiat cur- currencies, we're talking about pounds or euros or what have you. When all of a sudden someone goes, hang on a minute, it's not worth that. And everyone goes, oh, yeah, that's a point. Everything starts to go wrong very quickly. And that breakdown happens, doesn't it? Everything yes. begins to break down and everyone starts running around going, the sky's falling in. <laughs> yes, and I suppose if you if you look at ants, they do trust each other implicitly. Don't they? Because, <laughs> and maybe the reason it works for them is because they're very closely related, right? So well, they don't try to deceive each other. I think anybody who's, <laughs> I mean, every, anybody who's ever been on Harley Ed, uh, who, I don't know, has been sitting on a sun lounger mm. and dropped, I don't know, a little bit of ice cream or a bit of hot dog or a chip yes. or what have you. And then about, I don't know, half an hour later, one ant appears from nowhere. And then within an hour... They're all over it like a rash, aren't they? They are, exactly. It's extraordinary. Yes, and understanding how they do that is is something that we really want to do uh, as biologists, but also in robotics, right? Because, you know, you could think about, um, as you say, you you drop a sandwich, suddenly you've got a a line of ants, Mm. and that's based on the ants are kind of randomly wandering around. They have sort of happenstance, come across something interesting, but then they can recruit their friends, uh, their colony mates, through positive feedback, laying pheromone trails, and suddenly they've... 
they've is got that, a large number. Is that how it works? Because I mean, yeah. I, one always thinks that you know the ant go, as you say, wandering around on the off chance. I wonder if I'm going to find a bit of sandwich today. <laughs> oh, look at that! Quick, I'm going to run back to the nest and tell everybody there's a sandwich at two o'clock. Uh, uh, you know, and yes. off they go. Is that how it works, or is there a bit more complex than that? Well, I think randomness in the way that they walk around is actually a very important part. What you see okay. is you see randomness at like the micro level, at the level of the individual. If you look at it closely, it has a very kind of tortuous, wandering path. But then at the level of the whole colony, like the macro level, mm. is you see more order emerging because they can coordinate. And when they find scraps of information or scrap of food, <laughs> yeah. as the case may be, they can kind of coordinate together to go and collect it. And that's why, you know, in robotics, you might think of, um, say, a search and rescue mission. You know, there's been an earthquake and you're, you want to send out a swarm of a, a thousand drones to go and look for survivors. They might do essentially a kind of rather random search, but then they can call in the other drones when they find somebody to bring in assistance. Uh, and so we can kind of try and take ideas from That's a fascinating, biology. fascinating mm. idea, because if you, let's say, look at some of the natural disasters that have happened, they normally cover a very wide area, and it's almost impossible to work out where anybody may be. So there is a, a random nature, isn't there, to the search and rescue? That Well, the search bit, not so much the rescue bit. The rescue yes. bit is once you've found someone, then you bring in the resources to rescue, but it's the search bit that is utterly random. Yes, and I think fr from a mathematical point of view, this this question of how to optimally explore uh, unknown environments, you okay. know, a, a degree of randomness in your movement can actually be an asset. Um, Fascinating. Yes. A couple uh, of quick questions. We'll take the, 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 uh, we'll, uh, we'll take the latest thing from Rocha, then we'll talk more about your research. Um, robots... People are slightly fearful of robots. I mean, we know that they can make cars and they can spray cars and they, and they can, you know, do things. Hmm. But... You know, there's part of us, as I mentioned right in my introduction, you know, we were all expecting to have a robot running around cleaning up after us at home. Yes. But I wonder if we did have a robot running around cleaning up, like a, our own Robbie the robot, we'd be slightly freaked out because we think it might go a bit weird. I mean, I've seen the film I, Robot, for example, yes. with uh, Will Smith. You know, they, it seem, they seem benign until they go wrong and then they want to take us over. <laughs> um, is that part of the problem, do you think, with robots? We haven't quite got over the science fiction aspect of it. Yes, I think that is where a lot of people start from, isn't it? Is the idea of this kind of humanoid-looking robot that maybe is going to be your companion about the mm. house. But um, I think there is something... That goes mad. <laughs> 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 but I think, that, I think there is something kind of inherently deceptive about making a robot that looks like a human, because a robot can never be a human. It can never kind of replicate the whole sort of range of human capabilities and human experience because it's and this is the trouble is of human psychology we see a face and we think ah oh, there's there's a kind of human thought process behind that but mm. that's just not where we are in artificial intelligence what, what could, we can do that, in artificial I mean, could intelligence that is very narrow, probably not in really. our lifetime but could that happen could, i mean we're talking ultimately here about about soul and, and emotion aren't we we're talking about the the ability to to have random thoughts so as, as you say we talk about randomness which leads to a sort of collective approach mm. could you ever have a robot that is capable of of love <laughs> oh that's, that's a very tricky philosophical question yeah i know hey you know, you know why not um i don't i don't think so uh to to be honest with you i think essentially what, what we can do in artificial intelligence is what we call um narrow ai so you can do a an artificial intelligence that is very good at one particular task. So, you know, I don't know, recognising photos of cats or something mm, like that. Okay. Um, or maybe learning to, to pick up objects on a production line or something. And maybe what you could do is bolt together a series of these narrow capabilities to have some sort of general suite of So a number of singular abilities that could become a, a layer of abilities. I think so. But the kind of like general adaptability that we have as human beings, where we can kind of learn to do pretty much anything if if we put our minds to it, mm. I'm not, I'm not sure that that's going to be happening anytime soon. Okay, uh, let's, let's take a pause for, for Rochford. We'll talk more about your research, the randomness, uh, what ants, uh, what the randomness of ants and their community and their and how they live and what that could teach us and indeed what it informs you about your work with robotics. Uh, more from Dr. Edmund Hunt from the University of Bristol. After Roche, uh, still with me is Dr. Edmund. Hunt. He is a scientist at the University of Bristol who studies insects, animals, and applies that learning 
to robotics. So we were talking about ants, hmm. and ants are something that I know you've looked at. What can ants inform you as a scientist about how robotics will change and evolve? Well, I think I think like we were we were saying earlier, some of our challenges, if we want to take robotics maybe outside into the field, as it mm. were, uh, to, to do things like search and rescue, is that we need to have large numbers of robots. You know, really large numbers, not just a dozen or something, but maybe hundreds or even thousands of robots to, you know, look look at the forest fires in uh, Australia, yeah. for example, example, covering vast areas. So. You know, maybe what we need instead of one or two really sophisticated robots is to think about how can we get really large numbers of robots that are simple uh, to cooperate. Uh, and then what we can do is look at nature uh, to think about how do um, ant colonies, for example, coordinate. Uh, and they use this mechanism called self-organization. That's that's the key concept. Um, okay. Because the thing about the ants is they don't have leaders. They don't have... Um, sort of supervises them, telling them what to do. Because uh, you can think with an ant colony, well, they have a queen, so it's it's kind of a, mm. a monarchy, yeah. <laughs> as it were. You know, the order's coming down um, from maybe, on high. My, maybe one of the ants wants to go and live in Canada and the other ants aren't <laughs> happy about it, right. that sort of thing. Have an emergency yeah. meeting about it. Or something. <laughs> no, uh, it's not like that. They don't get their, their orders every morning. Right. It's, um, as I say, it's self-organised. So what they're doing is they're sort of looking around their immediate environment, thinking about, like, well, what needs doing? And if an ant happens to be near some food, by mm. chance, it will collect the food. And if it happens to be, you know, in the nest and it sees that part of the nest wall needs repairing, it will get to work repairing the wall. And, and, and other ants, because we've seen it, we come back to the analogy of dropping something on the floor when you're on holiday. Mm. You drop something, an ant spots it. And then within minutes, 10, 15 minutes, you've got other ants... They're all sort of looking at it and trying to work something out, but there's lots of them there. Then all of a sudden, that bit of food starts moving. They're moving it, aren't they? Yes. Back to the nest. They're taking it home, and they're working together. And there isn't a, there isn't a major and a captain and a lieutenant and a sergeant major and a corporal. Yes. They're all doing <laughs> it together. That's right. It's, it's very much decentralised. Um, and the great thing about the ants that, that we look at is the fact that they can use pheromone trails, for example. Right. So they communicate indirectly by modifying their environment with them, um, you know, laying down these chemical markers called, called pheromones. Um, or, for example, you look at termites. They also use this, this um, modification of environment um, for a mechanism called stigmagy. Uh, which is leaving marks that then stimulate other individuals when they come along to also do some work. Okay. So, you know, termites build these incredible termite mounds. They don't, they don't necessarily know a plan that they're, they're working to. It's just that they come along. <laughs> there isn't an architect termite with a guy, no, 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 no. You've got a bit to the right, bit to the right. Exactly. <laughs> so they maybe they just lay down a little bit of building material because yeah. they've got some to hand. And then another termite comes along and they say, well, look, here's a, an unfinished wall. I'm going to lay down a bit of building material there as well. Absolutely. So that's how they coordinate the construction, is through just seeing what needs to be done and sort of responding to the environment and communicating indirectly uh, so, that way. So you could, let's just take the forest fire an an analogy there. You talked about search and rescue, but the forest fire. So you could have uh, robots that are singularly tasked with looking for outbreaks of fire. They spot that outbreak of fire, and then they summon the other robots and say, I've just found the thing that we're all charged to look at, hmm. I've found it, we now need to put it out. Mm -hmm. So all those other robots respond to that one robot that spotted this thing, mm. and all the others pile in to put it out. Yes. Is that, it, in essence, what we're talking about here? Yes, or maybe maybe to inspect it more, more closely, okay. if you need to map it right, and find okay. out the extent of the fire. Some of them, as you say, could have like a, a specialism that they've got. It'll sort of fire extinguishers attached to them <laughs> so they would be called in to, to also but, work I mean, on putting it out. When you say it like that it sounds ridiculous but actually what we're mm. talking about here is something that is already happening in the insect world mm. that if applied to mechanics, robots effectively and mm. programmed to do so it would work because it works in the insect, it already naturally works Yes, exactly. Um, this is the whole idea of bio-inspiration, right? Okay. Is, that, is that nature has had millions and millions of years through evolution to try 
try all the different ways possible of solving a problem and then through natural selection it finds out well what works what works really well mm. and then that's sort of selected for and propagated down the generations based on survival isn't based it? on survival yeah. because it works you know uh, it's really put to the test <laughs> in so, that way so this is something that you're doing at the moment at the university of bristol um, and, and this research i'd imagine is ongoing it must be fascinating to, i mean i'm i'm, I'm it must be more than just dropping bits of sandwich on the desk and seeing which ants <laughs> go for it but but it must be fascinating to begin to see how you can apply this what stage are you at with the research so what i do nowadays is i'm i'm basically i split my time working in computer simulations so thinking about how can this work uh simulating really large numbers of robots and also trying out ideas up at the bristol robotics laboratory which is a shared facility between bristol university and Mm ue so it's up at the ue campus and we have our own swarm of 1,000 robots, um, and they're called kilobots because kilo is, you know, the, the prefix for 1,000. So mm. we have a thousand of these robots, and they're about the size of a 10p coin, and they basically can buzz around on the on a flat surface, and we can try out our ideas, try out our swarm algorithms uh, to see what works as they share information with each other, and we we can look at things about. You know, how can they make collective decisions, for example? And when you watch them, the, the med, uh, and you having been a bit involved in this, is there a moment where you, you know that they are mechanical, but they're almost behaving organically? Yes, almost. That, that's that the, must be quite a weird thing to yes. see, that you're seeing something that is clearly you know is mechanical, but it is behaving organically. This is the really fascinating <clears throat> thing, is because actually... You know, in in nature, we can see things that look incredibly complex, but actually what it boils down to is some really simple rules that the agents, the individuals are following, you know, and it might be, I'm going to try and stay a certain distance away from my neighbor. And if I get lost from the group, I'm going to try and rejoin it Mm. and that sort of thing. You you can boil it down to a a handful of simple rules, but then when you implement that on, say, a hundred or a thousand individuals, you have kind of really fascinating uh, emergent behaviour. So you think about like a flock of starlings in the well, sky. I was just thinking, example, I was thinking like a murmuration of starlings. Example. Exactly. You see a murmuration of starlings and you think, or even a, a, a shoal of fish, you think, how the hell are they not smashing into each other? Yeah. What? How does that, not, you know, you see that and they, they, they glide and they swoop and they swirl and they're, 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 they interplay and they go back on themselves yeah. in this sort of like a, like a, a sheet in a, in a summer breeze. You, you watch, How are they not banging into themselves? But that they is, don't. Yeah, that is the classic example of the starling murmurations. That you, you see these beautiful patterns in the sky, but if you put that into a computer simulation where basically the agent, simulated agent, is following three rules about yeah. saying, I'm going to stay close to my neighbours, I'm going to try and point in the same direction, yeah. uh, and then set it off, you, you see similar patterns in your computer simulation. Yes. and So that tells us that it's, it is possible. It's, it is possible to, to replicate these kinds of things in, in robotic systems, for example. We can have flocking or shoaling underwater. Wow. All sorts of things. Fascinating. Where can people find out more? I mean, is there a website where people can look at this stuff? Because, I mean, this is science fact, never mind science fiction. Yeah. Um, so if, if people want to read more about yeah. swarm robotics, uh, I wrote an essay quite recently um, called um, with a, an organization called Nesta. Yeah. Uh, so if you type in Nesta Tipping Point Prize, it was Nesta called... Nesta Tipping Point... I'm going to read this this weekend. Yes, Nesta Tipping it. Point Prize. Um, it's been fascinating having you here on the programme. It really has. Just to find out, again, there's so much research and so much brilliance that's going on here in our part of the world with UWE, with Bristol University, yeah. with Bath and, and Bath Spa as well. And it's all happening. And, and to think that ultimately we're talking about saving lives. Yeah. Potentially. Bristol's in, at the forefront of all of these things. It's, it's extraordinary, isn't mm. it? Uh, Dr. Edmund Hunt, um, scientist at the University of Bristol, studying insects, robotics, and all things in between. Thank you so much for coming in. Fascinating having you here. Yeah, thank you very much.